bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Isaiah 56, 7. These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. For all nations. Today, we're going to start a new series called A House of Prayer. I'm looking forward to this so much. Looking forward to today, next week, when Minister Terry, along with her daughter Gina, and my wife come up and talk more and get really deep into it on Mother's Day. It's going to be special. Make sure you come on in. And then the week after, Minister Brandon's going to come in. So this is going to be a focus on prayer. But when God says in Isaiah, which if you've never read the prophet Isaiah, and if you've never read what I call Isaiah 50s, man, the 50s are no joke. That means there's, there's, there's a lot of books in Isaiah. Man, go to the 50s where God starts giving his prophetic word on Jesus Christ to come. And this was so long before Jesus came, around 750, 800 years, 800 years, 850 years before Jesus came, started prophetically speaking. It's so powerful. And it's more than just us coming into a building and praying together and being happy about it. Right? That's not what it's, a, don't get me wrong, I love when we come like we were just worshiping in this house and at home, and there was joy in this place, there was love in this place, God was moving as we were praying, man, in his house. But the house is not a building, the house is the heart. The house is us together, not even me independently. I am not the house of God, we are the house. And we are called to be a house of prayer. It is talking about within the context of all nations, which in that time was foreign. Because it wasn't the Samaritans, it wasn't the Persians, it wasn't the Greeks, it definitely wasn't the Romans or any other nation. It was God's chosen people and God's chosen people alone. And God's talking about a time where all are going to come on in and be part of this incredible, beautiful body of Christ. And as we look around today, just look around you. Look at the beautiful, diverse, different faces in this house from all different walks and parts of life. It's about all people from all backgrounds being reconciled to God and one another and being able to talk with him like Adam and Eve in the garden. This is about reconciliation like we talked a couple weeks ago. This prayer, God is bringing us back into community with him, the ability to talk to him. That means the ability to hear his voice, to hear his will, to hear his words speaking into my life and me being able to open my heart and talk with him. It's an invitation to being with God once again and a promise. St. Augustine said, we pray not to instruct God, but to get our will in line with his. 
So often our prayer as we could, we just pray our will. We pray what we want, what we desire, what we feel, what we need. And that's part of the prayer of petition, which is a real prayer. As far as praying for what we need and what we're going through. But never are we meant to pray our will. It's all about his. To hear Khadijah sharing an incredible testimony and hearing her talk about, man, I want God's will for my life. I want God's will. I want God's promises. I want to align with him and not be controlled by the things of this world. And this really hits home right now, this topic of prayer. Because this year, many of you may remember, but some of you weren't even in the building. God gave us a word at the beginning of this year. Through, he used Minister Terry. And this is what he spoke to Minister Terry. He said, I am going to release the spirit of intercession upon this house. I am going to push out the spirit of intercession out of the confinement of one room and onto the masses. I will release it on encounter night. That's what God spoke to her that she shared with me and the leadership of this house that we said, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for your revelation. See, we believe in the prophetic word of God, which means God speaking to us today. God revealing his will and his direction to us today. We believe in that. So when we heard this, We said, yes, Lord. And then that night, it was released, which was January 4th. Now, this word that was released, many of you may not have been here. Some of you may not have showed up to that night. Some of you may have been here might not even remember it. Does that mean it didn't happen? Does that mean God did not speak? And what I'm saying is God can release something onto the earth, but we still have our role to play. We still need to line up to his will and his word to receive it. As I was preparing for today, I was reading, and we might get to this at the end of the service, Daniel 19, and Daniel had so much favor. And Daniel was praying, and an angel appeared to him immediately, and answered that prayer God sent immediately. And I was like, God, I want angels to respond to my prayer just like that. I'm standing. I'm going to have that faith, Khadijah. I'm going to stand. I'm gonna, and I just felt in my spirit immediately, are you going to live a consecrated life like Daniel? And I was like, oh, 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 it's conditional. Oh, I forgot. I just can't ask just for anything, no matter what. It, requires a response. So how are we as a church going to respond to this and continue to respond to this? Monday night prayer that you heard Minister Sandy announce saying tomorrow night we're going to meet in person at the gym. I apologize especially for those of you that tune into prayer from out of state and and things. You know, and now you're not going to be able... But God spoke, and this is a response to what God is saying. And I have something I want to share, because she also added, Minister Terry, she said, I saw his hands outstretched in front of me. And he said, you have carried a heavy load way too long. How many of you know that a lot of times within the church and within the kingdom of God, the few carry too much at times? We allow just too many, just, you know, just a few people to carry the heavy load as, you know, it's like when uh, 
we're kids, you know, mom, you know, cooks. My mom was never like this. She cooked, but she, you know, I had cousins. I go to my cousin's house. I was like, mom, why can't you be like that? Because she would cook, clean, take everything. You know, they wouldn't move for hours. My mom, can you also get me this? And they just cater. We treat church like that a lot, and God like that a lot of times. I saw his hands outstretched in front of me, and he said, you have carried a heavy load way too long. I then saw him peeling something off of me and draping it upon the church. I knew it was my mantle. So let's just back up one second. What is a mantle? Very simple. A mantle is a responsibility that passes from one person to another. A mantle is something that passes from one person to another. It's also a cloak or a covering. So Minister Terry, along with a team of intercessors, whether you know this or not, now you're going to know, Minister Terry and a team, a handful of intercessors, they pray every single week for this church and for the kingdom of God and for the church as a whole and for individuals. She will answer my call, Bishop's call, you know, Minister Brandon's call at three o'clock in the morning. And she definitely and the team will answer the Holy Spirit's call at three o'clock in the morning to get up and pray and to intercede on the behalf of of God's people. And God is saying in this day where we're going, this mantle is not just going to pass from her to a different leader that's going to take it over. It's going to pass and drape over the entire congregation as we are called to be intercessors. Wow. God. Give us wisdom. Give us insight. How to do this. Not to beat people up. How to reach people. To encourage people. To actually drape this over others. Let me speak to the intercessors in the house and online. I believe this is what God wants you to know today. And then we'll go back to teaching. God is calling you to come into agreement of dropping the mantle, this cloak of intercession over this church. It will be uncomfortable, but necessary. And the Lord wants you and all of us to know, and this is the exciting part, that the latter will be greater than the past when it comes to intercession in this house and in the kingdom of God. Because I believe it's not just what God is doing here. God is doing something in the body of Christ. He's doing something globally and he's doing something within this nation of getting us to truly focus on how and what we should be praying for and not relying on our grandmother's faith or our pastor's faith or our friend's faith to step up and to pray. No more is the day, Pastor Marco or Minister Sandy, man, can you pray for my teenager? You know, because I I, I can just bring them to you. Oh, we'll join your faith. We are going to do it together, but you got the cloak on too. You better be on your knees praying for your child. Pray, and we're going to get into that. I'm about to let me Let me just stay with this. So, so here, let me just do some teaching. Let me just do a little teaching because we got to understand. All right, so the main question is, what is intercession? Or what is prayer of intercession? Is that some just holy word? Is it, you know, I don't know. What are you, what are you talking about? Pastor Marco, I just started coming to church. I barely know how to pray. I, I, you said I can just talk to him, so I just say, what's up? It's a great prayer. I say it all the time, what's up, God? <laughs> Why are you doing this to me, Jesus? You know, I, I, Jesus said, well, <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. And I'm like, yes, thank you, Jesus. So the literal meaning 
of intercession is to stand in the chasm between man and God. There is a separation. There's a chasm. And when we intercede, it literally means we stand in between man who, whether it's a person, an individual that we know, that we don't know. It could be an enemy. It could be a politician. It can be a co-worker. It could be a stranger's face. It could be somebody we don't even know. And we pray in the spirit and we pray and we stand in the middle between them and God. The Hebrew word literally means to engage or to battle. To be on the offensive, not the defensive. The word in the Hebrew literally means to be on the offensive on behalf of someone else. The Greek word literally means to come between, to come between two parties. And to stand in the gap, to obstruct, to hold up, or even to block. To interpose on behalf of someone else. Which basically means to intervene between two parties. And that's why you can hear, and if you break down, there's a lot of different types of prayer. We can, if we had time, we can go through the list. But you'll hear and you'll read in the scripture, we'll read in 1 Timothy, where it talks about prayer of petition, and they also talk about a prayer of intercession. What's the difference? A lot of times, a prayer of petition can be on our behalf or on the behalf of our family. We have an invested interest of. Intercession literally means it has nothing to do with me. It's selfless. And it has a humility to it. In the nature of it. There's no interest. Bishop, when he started this church 32 years ago, I wasn't here. But he preached the entire first year, 52 weeks on prayer. That is the foundation, the legacy of who we are as a church and what we're stepping not just into, but what we're building upon. And one of the things that he ingrained in my head from sitting in the seat, just like many of you for years and years, when it came to prayer, he was like, you want to really pray? Don't pray for yourself. Stop praying for yourself, pray for others. Stop praying for yourself, pray for others. God knows what you need. God knows. Don't worry, he got your back. If you're going through something with your child, pray for somebody else's child, and God will take care of your child. If you're going through financial difficulties, don't spend three hours praying about your finances. Man, pray for somebody else's finances, and God knows you, and he Bishop was teaching us, teaching me, what a real true intercessor is and in that intercession is not like, oh, I'm not an intercessor. I can't pray like that. We get these lies, right? Like, oh, we're not called to be intercessors. No, I'm just called to say my little prayer before dinner and at night, you know, I'll make a checklist and pray. And that's all good. I have checklists. I have my prayer before meals, okay? It might not be as holy as yours, but rub-a-dub-dub, God just bless this grub, right? And they're prayers. But the heart of intercession touches the nerve of who God is. So let me continue. In the New Testament, it's not a form of aggression. It's a true act of humility and selflessness. You want to know what the greatest prayer of intercession ever was? In my opinion, my humble opinion, the greatest prayer of intercession, Jesus on the cross. As his body is dying and as his lungs are collapsing as he's bleeding out as he's going through this excruciating pain he says father forgive them father forgive them for they do not know what they're doing 
See, I would argue that Jesus didn't just pray a prayer of intercession. His whole life, his whole calling was intercession. When he stepped in front of the Pharisees and protected that woman caught in adultery that were ready to stone her, that was ready to kill her, he said, no, 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 no. He stepped in. When the storm rose and he was asleep in a boat and the apostles woke him up and said, Jesus, Jesus, we're going to drown, we're going to drown. And he spoke, he stepped in between the apostles and the storms of life and he calmed the sea. When he sat at the dinner table with actual sinners, with the tax collectors and others, and the Pharisees were like, Disciples, who is your rabbi? What is he doing? How could he even eat? He spoke, he said, <clears throat> are you talking about me? Let me tell you, we have come, you know, as a hospital to the sick. We're not a hospital for the whole, for those that got it all good. That's not what the kingdom of God is about. Jesus stood in the middle. When he prayed in John 17 in the garden, and he prayed, for his apostles and for all believers, when he prayed for us, he stood in between. And when he get to that cross and he died, he stood between the entire history of humanity. He stood between this chasm this ravine, this separation that the depths went all the way to hell itself, that it was death and pain. And Jesus stood there right in the middle. He got and he gave his whole entire self as a living sacrifice, as true intercession, standing in the gap. So that all of men, that all women, that the entire cosmos can be reconciled to God. He intervenes, not just a prayer of petition. Think about it in the most literal sense. Did you sign that petition? Yes, you heard. They're trying to, you know, put this uh, thing in the city and they're going to better it would be great for you to sign this petition whether for or against and you put it or online petitions I signed one the other day right I was like I believe in this cause let me sign this petition I put my name on it and that's how we like to pray just this petition we don't we don't have responsibility of it we did a good thing even it's a couple of dollars the difference between tithing a couple of dollars and hearing what Khadijah said you're like, oh, you're making me feel uncomfortable. But the heart, the heart is that intercession is not just signing a petition. It's the actually being a qualified lawyer and saying, now this is pro bono. I'm not taking a dime. I'm standing in between this person in the justice system because I believe they're innocent and they're not going to go to jail. They're not going to be thrown in prison. I'm fighting for their freedom. I want to let you know in the kingdom of God, we are all qualified lawyers, ambassadors of the kingdom of God to actually stand in the gap to do pro bono work for our entire lives on behalf of the lost, on behalf of the, the broken, the hurting, the disenfranchised, those I would even dare that are our enemies. You saying, Pastor Mark, you're just getting crazy. I am. Okay? So the cross is the most powerful form of intercession. And Jesus is, why do you think when we pray, for God to hear us, what are we praying? In what? In whose name? Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Because he is the intercessor. So when he called us to take up our cross and follow him, what does that mean? 
What does that look like? What does it practically, actually look like? It's standing in the gap between all humanity and God and making a way for people to be reconciled to him. See, when Jesus tells us to take up our cross, he is asking us to follow in his footsteps and to stand in the gap and intercede on behalf of the lost, the outcast, the marginalized, the unwanted, the condemned, and our very enemies. This is who Jesus tells us to intercede for. You ready for this one? Luke 6, verse 27 and 28. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. This is love. That you would lay down your life for your brother. True intercession. Pastor Marco, I just thought you was going to tell us that we just need to come together and pray on Monday nights. Yeah, we do. But I'm believing so much more. I believe that the latter will be greater. So I believe that prayer is going to break forth in this house. Right here in the presbytery, on the staff, in the children's ministry, young adults, youth ministry, I mean, in our alpha groups, in our life groups. Man, right at, at brunch today with your friends. But that's crazy. No, because when Jesus, when the Bible says to pray without ceasing, it doesn't mean that now when I go to, to brunch, I'm going to be like, okay, let's pray for everybody in here. And we just start shouting in tongues. It means I'm now standing in the gap. God, I'm willing to be led and hear from you. See, when we intercede, we actually take responsibility and ownership of what we're praying for. So don't tell me, you know, oh, uh, I, I'm interceding for the president. You know, I, I intercede for the president. You know, and that prayer is like once every three months that we pray, and we usually pray that he turns from his wicked ways and does the things of God. Okay. Great intercession. I'm not trying to be, maybe I am trying to be flippant. That's but when somebody says, I have been praying for our president every night, can't stop praying for him and his kids and his wife. Can't stop praying for God and the spirit of God that was in him from a child, from when he was raised in church, when he read the scriptures, that would get untangled and not be twisted. And God will just rise up the spirit. And I've just been praying and just been praying. I mean, it's so heavy. I've been... I mean, I'm actually like crying for him, and I don't even like him. I didn't even vote for him. But God got me loving this man so much and praying for him. Like, Whoo, intercession. And now if we stand on the outside of that and then judge that, whoo, just like those Pharisees outside of the dinner with Jesus and the Pharisees and Jesus and the tax collectors, how dare he have dinner with these people? There are different types of prayers. First Timothy says, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. So there's these different prayers. And what I'm saying is there's prayers of worship and praise as a form of thanksgiving, petition, supplication. I mean, there's all these prayers. But the prayer of intercession is what we truly should be aspiring to. 
And here's the heart, right? We have to ask ourselves, what gets me to pray? Why do I pray? And how do I pray? And what do I pray for? What motivates me to pray? What motivates you to pray? And here's a couple of things that I, I think that motivates us. Our emotions. Compassion. Our desires and interests. Our desperation. And duty. There might be others. But those, I think, encompass almost all of our prayers. And they're not necessarily wrong. They only can be twisted, and the enemy can come in when we start praying our will. So when our emotions are stirred, and then we pray, and we start telling God in our prayers what to do, instead of truly interceding and standing in the gap. I think prayer of compassion is what I call the prayer of compassion. It's probably one of the things we do more than anything else in our lives. It means we love people. We love the things, you know, we can love our country. We can love the community we're part of. We can love our heritage and our culture. We can love the people around us. We love our family. And those things, we're, we're spurred by compassion. So <clears throat> when somebody can come to you and say, you know, something so bad, whether, hey, my, my mom's sick. She might die. Can you pray? Do, do any of us say no? No, no I'm not going to pray for that. No, we pray then compassion. You know, it's a, we're, 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 yes. And we can pray for healing. God, we pray that you heal. And we pray for life. And life to the fullest. We play, you know, scripture. But it's a prayer of compassion. It might not be the will of God. That's hard. Right? It's hard because we all will die. And we're going to mostly die from some type of sickness, statistics say. And that's, I'm not being flippant or I'm trying to be as sensitive to what we're going through, what our family members are going through. My mom is sick right now, right, with, you know, with the mind and just to see it. And I'm, I still pray for healing. God, I'm praying, I'm praying. But I realize it might not be the will of God. God's will ultimately, and this is why intercession is so much powerful than petition is because God's ultimate goal, his heart, is that we're reconciled to him. So we are separated. There's a chasm. There's a disconnect. God wants us to stand in the middle and intercede so that we are ministers of reconciliation. We are reconciled to God. Celebration. Answer prayer. But guess what? I still might die of other things and there's consequences and there's all these other things of my actions, of my choices. You know, one thing Bishop used to say all the time, you know, you can ask me to pray for you after you smoked cigarettes for 40 years, but sometimes it's hard to realize that we, there's consequences for our decisions. David repented after he took a married woman, slept with her, and had her husband killed. Literally. God forgave him. He repented. But guess what? There were still consequences for his actions that he lived out all the days of his life with his actual family and his actual kids. That's a hard thing. So I'm praying for the will of God, and I want to know the will of God. Why do, you know, why is there so many unanswered prayers? Why do we hear in Alpha, man, I prayed and God didn't answer my prayer. God's not there. God's not there. Are we praying the will of the Father? Are we going back to St. Augustine 
from 1,700 years ago where he said, our purpose in prayer is not that we come to God with our will, with what we want him to do. Our prayer is that we would now know his will. We would be one with him. That's the heart of when it comes to a petition prayer for us. God, I'm coming to pray to you because I want to get closer to you. I want to know your will. But when it comes to praying for others, the spirit of intercession, to pray, and not just to pray, but to live out and act. That's what Jesus said when he said, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, you have turned it into a den of robbers. He's saying, man, this, this incredible temple, they're going to crucify him because, not just because he flipped the tables, but because Jesus said, I'm going to tear down this temple. You can tear it down in three days, I'm going to raise it back up. And they said, oh, blasphemous. And they started plotting, the Bible says. They started plotting to kill him. Because Jesus knew it wasn't going inside of these walls. He knew it was what lived inside of us and what we walked out and what we brought into the body of Christ, into the kingdom, which is all people reconciled to him, not having to go through works, not having to work and toil and then giving up your own livestock that you rely on and sacrificing it, where God's like, that's not what I want. I want your heart. I want your life. Will you come into my house of prayer and be in relationship with me? And will we be intercessors? Listen to this. There are, right, all these different ways that we are led to pray. But I want to pray the will of God. And I want to be able to let people know when it comes to pray. We don't know everything. We'll pray for a bunch. But God is good. So, man, if, if I'm sick... I'm going to pray for healing. If I don't get healed, I'm not going to think God's not real or God doesn't move. When and I, I just need to get the, when the four friends busted through the wall and brought the paralyzed man before Jesus, did Jesus just heal him? Did Jesus say, okay, you're healed, walk. Jesus didn't even talk to him about healing. Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. And then the Pharisees, overhearing, who are you? Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus said, oh, you don't believe who I say I am? Watch this then. Maybe you'll believe this. Get up, take your mat, and walk away. I could imagine, like, if I was the friend that like climbed up this roof, put a hole into it, and then lowered a grown man. And you know he wasn't no little man. He probably weighed like 250, you know. And, and they lowered this, and I lowered him in, and then I got down there, and I went through all of this. Like, man, I had to go through all of this, Jesus, just for you to. And then he's like, go and sin no more. Sin no more. No, 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 that's not why we came here, Jesus. My prayer is that you heal him. And Jesus is like, my will is that we are reconciled to the Father. We live in a fallen world. There is sin. There is injustice. There is confusion. There is corruption. There, are, there is death that is still working. The enemy is still like a lion out prowling around trying to steal, kill, and destroy but salvation is ours, reconciliation. And we are to stand in the gap and be all about it. But that's why I want our prayers to be led by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, verse 26. This is for us that are Christians. Those that are new and you're, you're like, don't, you know, let me just speak to Christians in this house real quick and online. Verse 26. Verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. 
We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. I want the will of God. I want his Spirit I don't want to just come into a building and just shout and just go crazy and hope God sends some Peter Pan, you know, sprinkly fairy dust down that will touch me and get me to run around 17 times shouting like a madman and sweating through my clothes. That is, no, no. I want the fruit of the Spirit. I want peace. I want kindness. I want goodness. I want self-control, patience, and love. This is who God, so that I can then, like Daniel, literally step into the chasm that God is calling us as a church and as believers, as the kingdom of God is called to, as ministers of reconciliation, and stand in the chasm And be able to pray his will and speak with authority and draw people unto him with the fruit of the Spirit. Not just things that may or may not be of God, may or may not be his will, may make me feel better for half an hour or for three hour service, depending on what kind of church you go to. God is calling us to be intercessors. That's why in Genesis, I mean, in Daniel 19, go and read this. Daniel intercedes for Jerusalem and for Israel. It's a great, read it, 1 through 19. Daniel is a man of God. He is living in exile in Babylon. And now Babylon has just been overthrown by the Persians or the Syrians. And he's in the middle of this. He's been for 70 years in exile. And he's praying. And he quotes God's word. And he says, God, when I was a little boy, there was this prophet that the kings rejected, Jeremiah. And he spoke your word and said, for 70 years, the temple was going to be destroyed and people in your kingdom but after 70 years you were going to restore it you were going to bring your people back together so lord god i pray today i pray right now for the kings and the you know and and the kings and the kingdoms and and the rulers that have gone before me that walked away from you that didn't serve you that rebelled against you that sinned against you for my people for me myself for my forefathers that didn't do the things you called on them to do they continued to sin and they did the things that you warned them not to do and you're judgment came your righteous good judgment that is perfect but lord god the 70 years are over So I'm standing, I'm interceding, I'm standing in this gap and I'm praying, God, for you to bring your kingdom back, for you to bring Israel back, your people back, for you to restore the temple. And then he says, while he was still praying, the archangel Gabriel himself showed up and answered him. And gave him, said, let me just read this. This is what he said to him. In verse 20. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and making my request to the Lord, my God, for his holy hill, While I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. Just on a side note, he hasn't been in Jerusalem for 70 years. There have been no evening sacrifices for 70 years, especially in Babylon. And this man is still living according to the law, according to God's word, while He's in Babylon. 
That's why he's the man and why the angel responded like that and why me, I got to pray a little bit longer, okay? (laughs) And he instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. I've come to line you up with the will of the Father. I'm going to give you insight and understanding, revelation, so that you know what God is doing and going to do. As soon as you began to pray, a word went out, which I have come to tell you, and God hears our prayers. Now, whether he sends an angel right away or not, that's a whole different story. I've come to tell you, You are highly esteemed. You are highly favored. You are highly loved. Wow. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. God is telling us today, consider the word I gave to you through Terry in the end of last year and the beginning of this year. And understand the vision of it. Understand what we're moving into. It is showing up on Mondays, tomorrow night, in the gym to pray. I'm speaking it and believing it, that we will mature in Christ, and that gym is going to be too small, and we will be here. God's mouth to our ears but at the same time the vision that we are intercessors cloaked with this called to be intercessors in first Timothy it wasn't a suggestion maybe you should throw up some prayers of intercession once a while no no prayer of intercession is for all of us it's for all who would dare to hear and follow Christ Jesus and dare to be a minister of reconciliation. Isaiah 56, 8. I can only imagine what Daniel actually thought when he heard those words because I just read a small part of it. As he starts to break it down, he breaks down and says, no, I'm not going to rebuild the temple like you think and restore. I have a bigger plan. He tells him about Jesus. Back then, all the way back then, he tells Daniel about Jesus. And he says, I have a different plan. This is my will. This is how I'm going to restore, truly, truly restore. I can imagine Daniel hearing that and then thinking of prophet Isaiah. In his words, in thinking about the word God gave to him when he interpreted the dream of Nebuchadnezzar about the statue and how they were all going to fall. And I could just imagine him saying, wow. And I guarantee you, I don't know this for a fact and I don't know this by scripture. I just know this by two and two is four. He never prayed that prayer again the same exact way. He never stood in the gap of intercession and prayed that way because now he knew God's fuller will and vision and understanding, and it changed him. Will it change us today? Would God's word, understanding Jesus and what his life was and how he calls us to live that same life, how he calls us to take up our cross and to stand in the chasm and to literally die and give of ourselves so that people can know him whether that's a three o'clock in the morning wake up or whether it's a coffee conversation with a co-worker and then these words in Isaiah 56 verse 8 after he talks about the house of prayer for all nations, the Lord says, the sovereign Lord declares, 
He who gathers the exiles of Israel. I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. God is desiring for his house to have all those that are lost, that are disenfranchised, that are exiles, that are eunuchs, that are foreigners, that are part of all the communities within this world that we could very easily protest and can very easily not have, you know, be like, how, what, and not understand. And God's saying, don't worry, that might not be your cross, but here's your cross, and here's where I'm sending you, and here's where I'm sending you. Do you know what your cross is? Do you know what you should be interceding and standing in the chasm for? And if you don't, just start trying. Start going after it, and God will begin to lead you. Come to Monday nights. As you won't just be called to pray, you're going to start learning to pray. And let's believe. Stand up with me as we close here. If you have, I totally forgot about communion. Communion is an invitation not just to be restored to the kingdom of God, but to be part of the kingdom of God, to be joint heirs in the kingdom of God. Jesus says, I convey to you a kingdom, literally meaning I hand you the keys to the house. It's as much yours as it is mine. So as we come, can we pray with the spirit and the humility of saying, God, I don't just want to pray selfish prayers anymore. I will pray my prayers of petition. I will pray my prayers of compassion. I will pray my prayers of thanksgiving. I will even get my will confused sometimes. But Lord God, Jesus said he only speaks what he hears the Father say. He only does what he sees the Father doing. Jesus, you were so locked in to the will of God that even when you interacted with the most disenfranchised people from God and from Israel they responded because you brought so much love and life and hope and truth so Lord God I pray that as we partake in this bread and in this cup that we will be one with you joining you in the chasm of this world longing and willing to intercede on the behalf of all men and women from all walks of life to truly be reconciled with you so that we can truly be a house of prayer. You may partake. And Lord God, we don't foolishly run into this. We ask that your blood always forgives us, cleanses us, washes us of our sins, and makes us worthy to come to the throne room of grace boldly. Like your word says, you may partake. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day and for this time. Grab the hand of the person next to you. Lord God, at home, grab the hand of the person next to you. God, we pray that we are one in you. We pray, Lord God, that we hear your word and we, you bring us understanding and we know the vision. So cloak your mantle of intercession. 
on all of us. Even if we don't feel worthy. Even if sometimes we feel like we throw it off and leave it in the back of the closet. I pray, Lord God, that we put it on and we never take it off. That we sleep in it. And that it has the aroma of you that everybody will smell. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We love you. See you tomorrow night right down the street at the gym. Have a wonderful Sunday. Thank you for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed our presentation. Would you consider partnering with us to share the hope of God and the love of Jesus by giving? You can give your gift at klcc.us forward slash give. Thank you for your generosity. Also, we would love to connect with you. So please follow, like, and subscribe to all of our social media platforms, as well as downloading our app on both the Apple and Google Play stores. Be sure to turn on notifications so you never miss a thing. Thanks for watching and see you next time.